Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the IDP Expedition 377 information webinar, and uh, thank you for connecting with us to learn more about our expedition uh, to core and downhole log on the Lomonosov Ridge in the Arctic Ocean. Um, I hope everyone is faring well during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I'm sure you will be aware of the delays and the cancellations to IDP cruises recently, uh, but everyone involved in the programme is working hard to mitigate the impact of COVID as far as possible and keep scientific drilling going in some form. So for this particular expedition, uh, planning is proceeding as normal for the time being. However, I will say a few words about COVID mitigation measures at the end of, of, of this webinar. So my name is David McEnroy. I'm your webinar host uh, today, um, as well as the science manager for the ECORD Science Operator, or ESO. Uh, and we are one of three agencies that will be jointly implementing this expedition. We're working closely with the Swedish Polar Research Secretariat and Arctic Marine Solutions. And together we are jointly responsible for implementing this expedition for ECORD under the auspices of IODP. Uh, joining me for this webinar are Expedition Co-Chief Scientist Professor Rudiger Stein from the Marum University of Bremen in Germany and Professor Kristen St. John from James Madison University in the United States. Uh, and we also have the Expedition Project Manager Jez Everest from ECORD Science Operator. He's with us as well. So we're very pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you about the scientific and technical aspects of this expedition and hopefully we can persuade you all to apply to join the science party. Um, just before we start, uh, just please note that this webinar is being recorded and uh, it may include a record of any questions and answers and chat conversations that, that we share and the recording will eventually be made public. Okay, let's get started then. So in a few moments, I will ask Rudiger to take over and explain the scientific objectives behind this expedition. Um, after he's finished, Jez will explain how this expedition will be implemented. Um, I have no doubt that some of you have IDP experience on either the Joides Resolution or the CHICU, but I'm also sure that many of you will never have participated in IDP before. So this expedition is what is called an IDP mission-specific platform expedition, uh, and Jez will talk about what that means shortly because these expeditions have some significant differences compared to other IDP expeditions that everybody should be aware of. Um, I, will then, I will then cover the application process and some of the steps that will take place after you apply. And then all going to plan, we should have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions um, at the end. Uh, we'll try not to go over the hour, but we can do so if there are, are a lot of questions. Um, it's of course also fine to leave the webinar at any point. Um, you won't interrupt proceedings if you do so. So during the webinar, please register any questions you might have using the Q&A window please try not to use the chat function. Um, it's much easier for the panel if we can just view one window for questions and not two. So please Q&A window only for questions. And we'll save all the questions until the end and then we'll try and answer as many as we can. Okay, just one quick message from me before I hand over to uh, Rudy. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the past attempts that we've made to implement our COP. Um, this proposal has been with the ECORD facility board and available for scheduling since 2014. Uh, and we've had some false starts along the way to get our COP implemented in both 2018 and in 2021. Um, so I'm sure for some of you, this is the third our COP webinar that you've attended. And you might be wondering if this attempt will fare any better than the others. Well, I can tell you that we are considerably, we're in a considerably better position today compared to earlier webinars. Uh, and you will hear later from Jez that the fleet has been selected and signed up. Um, and unlike previous webinars, we can share details about the actual contractors who, who we will be working with to make our COP a success. So we have the main pieces of the operational jigsaw in place in a way that we didn't have before at this stage. And so we're very confident now that our COP will indeed be implemented next year in 2022. Okay, I'll now make the switch to bring Rudiger online to start the Co-Chief Science presentation. So if you just stand by everyone, and Rudy, can I please ask you to share your screen? Yes. One second. Okay, does it work? Yep, perfect, thank you. Okay, when I start. 
Okay, also hello from my side, Odi Stein. I'm one of the co-chiefs uh, and, and Kirsten, uh, Kristen St. John, sorry, Kirsten is my wife. Kristen St. John is also with us uh, as uh, the second co-chief and uh, she's also here to answer question <coughs> at the very end. So uh, the overall theme is the long-term climate uh, or the reconstruction of the long-term climate uh, in the Arctic Ocean. The uh, transition from greenhouse to ice house and uh, when we talk about climate change I would like to start with a few words about the modern climate change we are all aware about <clears throat> and we know since uh, for, for decades or so there is a strong increase uh, in, in temperature uh, coinciding with the increase in CO2 and what you can see here on this uh, 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 plot very nicely that in the Arctic Ocean, in the high northern latitude, this climate change is much more drastic than in the other world areas. And so that's why we're talking about the Arctic amplification. And uh, here, especially the, the Arctic sea ice is a, a major <coughs> trigger on one hand. And uh, in the Arctic sea ice record, you see also very nicely the strong decrease here in sea ice. So we are starting here for 1900 with historical observations. And here we have from 1979, the satellite observation, and you see the strong decrease in sea ice. Um, and then you can extrapolate that into the future using the different uh, IPCC scenarios. So it might be that in a few decades, uh, we do not have any sea ice uh, in the uh, North Pole area. So, um, but such uh, ice free uh, summer seasons. Uh, we might have here in the near future, we also had in the past several times. Uh, and uh, so from this point of view, we would like to go back in time several million of years uh, to, to study the paleoclimatic evolution. Um, and uh, we are doing this in order to understand the processes controlling climate change. And here, uh, if we go uh, back uh, in, into time, it's of uh, major importance to look at the long-term climate uh, records. So you can look at glacial interglacial variability, but if you go further back in time, you even can study extreme warm climate periods that might look similar uh, to our near future. Um, and um, this is also a major theme of the uh, running uh, new science plan, uh, the IODP new science plan, uh, looking at uh, the linking or linkages between climate, ice sheets, sea level, sea ice, and so on. So this is our overall interest. <clears throat> but if you are interested in the long-term uh, climate record, the long-term Arctic Ocean climate record, you will realize that there are not many sed uh, uh, sedimentary sections that can be used to study the long-term climate change. For the uppermost uh, climate history, you have hundreds of cores you can study but if you go back in time, so this is a time scale here of 100 million of years, there are only a few uh, short cores that were available to study uh, past climate changes a million of years ago. But this was prior to the very famous first scientific drilling in the Arctic Ocean, the ASICS expedition in 2004, um, three ships uh, expedition, two icebreakers and one, one drill ship. Um, they went uh, to uh, Lomonosov Bridge, <clears throat> close to the North Pole, and for the first time, uh, a long sedimentary section, so uh, it goes down uh, about 430 of meters, a long sedimentary section could be drilled, and this was really a major scientific uh, uh, breakthrough. And uh, you see here on this uh, uh, H-Depth plot um, that uh, we can go back into the Paleocene, but if you look at this uh, reconstruction, there is a major hiatus here in the middle part. So that means from 40 to 18 million years before present, there's a major gap. This is uh, maybe one half of the scientists is thinking about. And there is another, an alternate age model um, uh, based on this. There is no hiatus, but strongly reduced sedimentation rate. Who is right? It's still open. Um, so in any case, uh, there are major outcomes of the, the uh, Arctic, of the ASEX drilling, uh, very famous papers and new findings about the 
conditions uh, during the PETM and ECO, it was quite warm. The, the uh, ECHO, the uh, early Eocene uh, climate optimum, it was warm and wet. And um, then uh, we have here freshwater event uh, around 59 million of years and the very early onset of sea ice. So no, nobody did think about this. Uh, so in the literature, people thought it was about 50 million years before present, but uh, with ASEX, it's clear, it became clear that much, much earlier, similar to the uh, Southern Ocean uh, around Antarctica, uh, sea ice started to occur. But we should have in mind, it's still the one and only uh, record we have here uh, in the uh, entire Arctic Ocean. And that's why we thought a uh, long time ago, uh, there is a strong need for an, uh, uh, an additional Arctic uh, Ocean or an IODP, a scientific drilling expedition into the Arctic Ocean. And uh, so there was a large team uh, of uh, an international team of scientists. We uh, sit together and uh, put together a proposal. And so the overall interest is to get a complete stratigraphic sedimentary record that allows the reconstruction of the long-term climate history of the Central Arctic Ocean. And of course, it cannot be done within a few years or months or something. So it was a long way, a long way here until we could publish or this uh, press uh, release could be published a few weeks ago, we made it. And, um, and again, it was a long uh, way and uh, there were key um, uh, milestones here with these uh, site survey expeditions using Polarstern in 2008, 2014 and 2018. Um, okay, now we made it and uh, the call is open and uh, I would like to say a few words about the key scientific objectives. And uh, I would like to start with this uh, journal comment. I think this ca characterizes the expedition quite well. So it's really a uniquely challenging, uh, challenging uh, mission. And uh, we would like to drill 900 meter into the uh, seafloor. Um, this is twice of the A6 uh, drill depths. And uh, again, it's in a nice covered region. So it's really a challenge. And, uh, not only for science, but also for the technology, Dave and Jess will talk later about. And so I think we can call it as a high risk, uh, but also high uh, reward expedition. Um, so 900 meter of sediments I, uh, sh I've shown here. And what we would like to get is the greenhouse, ice house climate transition. And um, also would like to solve, and I would like to highlight this here, the uh, controversial debate about the uh, age model of the ASEX drill hole. Is there a hiatus or is there no hiatus? Again, it's still open. Um, and what I, also would, or what I also would like to highlight within the next minutes is that even, even if we cannot reach the 900 meter, yeah, so it's, it's a challenging ex expedition. So we have the strong, might have strong ice conditions and so on. So there's no guarantee, of course, but what I would like to show you, even if we cannot make it down to the lowermost part here, most of the objectives we already can get uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, upper, uh, upper part uh, of the, the record. So what are the key objectives? I would like to highlight a few of ones of them. Uh, one thing is that we know that from, from the ASEX drill hole that there was this change from oxenic to anoxic on condition, uh, ocean long time ago. So that means in the Eocene here from the uh, nice uh, ESEC, uh, ESEC, uh, ASEX uh, records, we know there was a quite isolated uh, ocean with oxenic conditions with these beautiful organic carbon rich sediments. Um, and totally different in comparison to the modern ocean with oxy conditions, yeah? And somewhere in between, so here we have the change from an open, uh, from an uh, uh, oxygenic ocean to an uh, oxic ocean. And this is related to the opening of Fram Strait. But exactly when this happened, well, it depends on the age model you are using. So uh, there is still here the question, was it in the Oligocene? Was it in the Miocene? Uh, so this answer we would like to, to uh, or this uh, problem we would like to answer. Another uh, 
discussion, uh, uh, quite a uh, strong controversy discussion is the extent and the timing of the uh, 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 glaciations. This huge ice sheet we have here around the Arctic Ocean. Um, and uh, there are some people and uh, especially the group around uh, Martin Jakobsen, they think uh, that there was a huge ice shelf covering the entire Arctic Ocean. And there are strong arguments from the uh, uh, seismic data and, and from the mapping uh, of the seas uh, of the ocean floor that uh, uh, they found erosional uh, features, that there was strong erosion related to ice shelf, of, uh, uh, to an ice shelf advance. And uh, then a um, huge ice sheet is also postulated by others here in East Siberia. And with our drilling here uh, on this part of Lomonosov Ridge, we hope uh, and we are pretty sure that we get um, um, very precise and, and uh, data on, on this and also that we are able to get an information about the timing of these ice uh, sheets. So the major uh, extent of these ice, when did this happen and when did that happen for the first time? The other thing uh, which is also a highlight in my mind is to look at the history of the Siberian river discharge, which of course strongly influences the salinity in the Arctic Ocean that further on influences the sea ice formation. And there are different hypotheses. That means on one hand, you have here the, the, the uh, uh, Pliocene, uh, early Pliocene, the early mid Pliocene, the, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama. By this, you get a transport of warm water towards the north. You get um, increased moisture transport via the westerly towards Siberia. And by this, you get an increased river discharge and low saline water was pumped into the Arctic Ocean. There is another hypothesis. Also, the, the timing is uh, of a uh, question, uh, uh, so, uh, question mark. Might be in the uh, late Miocene, early Pliocene. That is uh, a strong change in the river discharge from Siberia. As you know, today we have the huge rivers, the Op, the Yenisei, the Lena, pumping huge amount of fresh water into the Arctic Ocean. But before the uplift of the Tibetan Plateau and the Mongolian Plateau, the freshwater was supply, the supply, uh, the drainage was towards uh, the south. And so there is also an hypothesis that this, uh, this uh, tectonic boundary conditions that have controlled the discharge into the Arctic Ocean, and this has an influence of sea ice and ice sheet formation. So again, we are sitting here directly in front of the river discharge. I mentioned the, uh, the Arctic sea ice cover. This is also, of course, uh, of major interest. Uh, we have some information about the onset here of the uh, 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 sea ice in the Central Arctic Ocean from this nice record put together by, by Christen, by Christen St. John, uh, in this very famous paper that uh, in the uh, around 41, 46 million years before present, we had the first, the first occurrence of sea ice. And then the key question is the change from seasonal to perennial conditions, sea ice condition we have today. Also a lot of question marks we would like to study. And finally, in the short uh, overview or short summary, uh, uh, a key aspect will be the uh, comparison between the marine and terrestrial climate records. There is this beautiful, this beautiful Elke Gutgen record um, obtained during the ICDP drilling uh, and uh, there is a high resolution record of the last 3.6 million years of terrestrial climate. And we would like to compare that uh, with our ISEX, uh, sorry, Aircroft uh, record to do this comparison between the IODP uh, marine drilling and the ICDP drilling on land. Okay. And just a few, uh, two, three more slides about the approach. So, uh, during the site survey expeditions, we found uh, a couple of uh, drill sites um, and potential drill sites. And uh, that uh, in, in this, uh, this location, we might be able to get the, uh, um, the record down to the uh, EU scene. And uh, um, these are, most of them are, of course, alternate sites, what we have selected is one primary site here on Southern Lomonosov Bridge um, and uh, where we plan to drill these 900 meters 
and um, and um, this is shown here on, on the, the seismic uh, uh, record uh, of that area is shown here. So you have here the key or the, the, the deep uh, drilling um, uh, through the different reflectors. So there's a, uh, the, the quaternary and pliocene, then we have a very thick miocene and the oligocene eocene. And so the key target will be here, the purple uh, reflector we would like, like to drill through. So again, these are 900 meter of sediments. So it's really a challenging uh, mission, uh, mission. But with this last slide, I would like to highlight or to summarize again all the key, the key objectives, um, the uh, uh, timing of and extent of the ice uh, sheets, the glaciations, the change from oxenic to oxy conditions, uh, the severe river discharge, uh, specific extreme warm climate intervals in the comparison between marine and terrestrial records. Most of these objectives we also uh, already would get if we, for whatever reason, we cannot make it down to the, the, the deepest part here. Uh, so again, very challenging, but we are very optimistic that most of the science we will get in the time we will have. And with this, I think I say thank you very much. And, uh, and we are open for questions later on. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Rudy, for that. Um, I see that some questions have started to arrive, but we will hold them, as Rudy says, until the end, um, as we want to make sure that all the information is given. So uh, let's move on now to the implementation of um, the expedition. Um, I'd like to now introduce Jez Everest, um, who is our expedition project manager, and he will now give an overview of how this expedition will be run as a mission specific platform expedition. So let me just share my screen. Are you going to go for it, Jez? Yeah. Okay. I'm having the same problem again, Dave. Yeah, so no problem. I'll stop I'll, sharing. I'll share from my side. Okay. Just let me know when to advance. Okay, I just have to rearrange things. Can you, can you see my screen? I'm just having a few problems moving things around at the moment, Dave. Hang on a sec. Okay. Right. Okay. Apologies for that, everybody. Uh, my uh, laptop is aged and dying. So, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jez Everest. I'm the Expedition Project Manager on Expedition 377. And I'm just going to talk in very general terms for about 10 or 15 minutes about the operational side of the expedition. So I'll begin by explaining just what a, an IODP mission specific platform actually is uh, before touching on the expedition schedule. And then I'll go on to talk about the platform itself and the drilling strategy that we'll employ. Uh, I'll briefly go through the standard measurements that we're going to take offshore and introduce a key part of all MSPs, which is the onshore science party and the activities that actually take place there. Then I'll hand back to Dave so that he can give you some details on the application process for scientists who would like to participate. So if you want to move on, Dave. So for this expedition, we won't be using either of the two dedicated IODP vessels, the US operated Joy Deeds Resolution or the Japanese operated Chikyu, two vessels that I'm sure some of you will be familiar with already. Instead, we'll be using what's called a mission specific platform which is a vessel that's specially contracted to meet the unusual requirements of certain IADP expeditions. These can be things like working in very shallow water or in ice covered seas like we might be doing here. In the case of ARCOP, there is obviously a potential challenge with ice. And even though we won't know the exact ice conditions until much nearer the time, Arctic Marine Solutions have determined that a three ship fleet comprised of an ice capable drill ship plus a near field icebreaker and finally a far field icebreaker is the most effective way to manage any ice that's present 
and I'll talk more about the fleet in a moment. Although MSPs and other IODP expeditions have several common elements, there are some key differences that you should be aware of. So if we move on, Dave. Um, yep. So before I go into further details about ARCOP, I'll show you a brief outline of this expedition and most other MSPs. First, of all, first off, there will be the normal number of scientists for an IRDP expedition with around 30 scientists forming the science party. And about seven to 12 of those will participate offshore. And again, Dave? The expedition is gonna be made up of two parts. The first is the offshore phase. And during the offshore phase, because accommodation and lab space on board ship is limited, we don't split the cores at sea and we only focus on the essential and time sensitive tasks. And these are obviously measurement of ephemeral properties, measurements required to guide the drilling to recover the best quality core that we can, downhole logging, and time sensitive sampling. So for example, microbiology where sample properties might degrade over time. So these seven to 12 scientists from the science party who participate offshore, so it'll be less than half of the full science party, and they'll be chosen based on the expertise needed to carry out these offshore tasks. If you apply and your application is successful, your invitation letter will specify if you're being invited as an offshore and an onshore scientist or an onshore only scientist. So you will know at the invitation stage what your commitment to the expedition actually will be. If you wish, you can state on your application that you want to be considered for an onshore only position, and that's absolutely fine. What you can't do, however, is apply for an offshore only position. I'll also say at this stage that there's no disadvantage at all to being an onshore only scientist. All the data and sample information will be made available online for the whole science party to access soon after the offshore phase is complete. So you click again, Dave. So following the offshore phase, part two is the onshore science party. This is held at the IODP Bremen core repository in Germany. And this is where the cores are split and the full suite of IODP measurements, descriptions and sampling takes place. The whole science party, including those who sailed offshore, are expected to attend. And the, OS the OSP is therefore more than just a sampling party that sometimes occurs for other IODP platforms. It is in fact more equivalent to the main analysis that usually takes place offshore on the larger IODP vessels. So here, the key point, Dave, is that the expedition is both offshore and onshore phases together. Okay, next slide. As Rudy's already told us, the expedition drill site is towards the southern end of the Lomonosov Ridge, roughly halfway between the North Pole and the Russian coast and south of the location of the 2004 ASEX expedition. Currently, the offshore part of the expedition is scheduled for 50 days within a window between the start of August and the end of September, 2022. We currently don't know the exact dates, nor the departure or return ports, as these will be subject to negotiations with the platform and the drilling contractor. But these details will definitely be shared with invited scientists in the invitation materials. If this planned period for the offshore phase holds, and we don't expect it to change, then we expect to hold the onshore science party in Bremen, Germany, either late in 2022 or more likely early in 2023. And again, the exact dates of this will be shared with the invited scientists. And we hope to be able to include all of the expedition dates, both offshore and onshore, on the invitation letter so that everybody is aware of their commitment before accepting the invite. So, as Dave mentioned earlier, you, next slide. We're able to uh, announce at this stage that the platform for the ARCOP expedition is the ice capable drilling vessel Dina Polaris. And this is being provided by the drilling and site investigation company Geoquip Marine. The Dina Polaris is a class two DP vessel equipped with an integrated heave compensated deep water drilling rig. And she was built in 2017. Since the rig is already integrated, our mobilization should be relatively simple and there's no need to install a temporary rig like we did in the ASEX expedition in 2004. The rig is capable of drilling to a combined water and depth below seabed of 2,500 meters, so much more than we actually need. And the rig has been used successfully on a large number of projects, including previous IDP experience on expedition 347 in the Baltic. 
The coring tools will be deployed using the wireline coring method, which provides a mechanism to continuously core sediments and rock and recover the cores of the deck in core barrels, which are then handled and curated by ESO curators before being passed to the science party for their various initial analyses. The coring tools and bottom hole assemblies can be varied depending on the lithologies being drilled, and the ESO drilling coordinators will work with GEOQUIP and the science party to select the most appropriate coring tools and will carry a range of different bits and spares to cope with expected and unexpected lithologies. The Dino Polaris has plenty of onboard space for visiting scientists and operator staff, with 97 berths in total, five offices, conference room, rec recreational space, and space on the deck for the ESO containerized laboratories. There's also some lab space on board, which we may be able to make use of in addition to our containerized labs. She has satellite broadband, but ESO will also take a broadband system which will be capable of transferring email and files to and from shore and can also support standard definition live video. Next slide. Accompanying the Dina Polaris will be two icebreakers. The powerful Victor Chernomedin, a Russian icebreaker, will manage incoming large ice flows in the far field, and the more maneuverable near field icebreaker will be the Swedish Odin. And SPRS and AMS have carried out modeling to show this fleet combination and system is our most effective method of ice management to keep the drill ship on location at the site. All of the science party and the operator staff will be accommodated on the Dina Polaris, meaning that there'll be no need for helicopter transfers between vessels, which some people might find disappointing. Next slide. So ice management is obviously going to be critical for this expedition. And in this case, the ice management will be run by Arctic Marine Solutions, who have significant experience in working in Arctic ice conditions. They will be carrying out the well-proven method of sectorized ice management using ice movement forecasts based on satellite data, radar, ice drift trackers, and weather to instruct the fleet to defend a secure zone where the drill ship will operate. Coordinating the ships through their individual captains and integrating with the drilling activity is a challenging and specialist task. And SPRS have subcontracted Arctic Marine Solutions for this task, who have personnel with experience from ASEX and other commercial Arctic drilling projects. If we're unlucky, we'll have heavy moving ice that will need to be managed. We will obviously be prepared for this, but in that situation, the risk of being pushed off the site by unmanageable ice will be higher which is critical since our depth of penetration is twice that of ASEX, 900 meters below seafloor compared with 428. If we're lucky, however, there may be no ice at all, just like in late summer 2020. So next slide. So back down on the deck, I'd like to give you a feel for the offshore environment and how we actually arrange MX, MSP expeditions on unfamiliar vessels. As an example, this photo on the left was taken during our 2013 expedition in the Baltic from near the rig looking down on the working deck and drill floor. Dave, can you highlight those? There we go. This is a customized setup changing with every MSP and it's the hallmark of MSP expedition. Being a temporary setup, the working deck is not quite as polished as other research vessels can sometimes be. But what it does offer is the flexibility to put whatever infrastructure we need on board to meet the expedition's objectives. On the right is the core bench, which you can see on the deck view here, Dave. There we go. And this is where the recovered cores are taken out of the core barrel and prepared by the ESO curators. The cores then make their way into this configuration of blue containers. Dave, up at the top, and that's it. And these are the ESO containerized laboratories where the initial scientific analyses are carried out. And the next picture I show you is where the magic happens. Next slide, Dave. Okay. So this is what is known as Main Street. And these images are from the most recent expedition to the Gulf of Corinth in 2017. Basically, what we do is we deploy two rows of ESO container labs facing onto a common walkway with the containers arranged to follow the natural core workflow. And the whole cores and their subsamples can be easily transferred back and forth from station to station in a logical manner. Next slide. So looking into the containers, we can see the kind of working environment that scientists can expect should they become part of the offshore team. First, we have the core curation container, which is the first port of call for the new cores arriving on the deck. We also have the petrophysics container, 
with the multi-sensor core logger or MSCL. There's a clean geochemistry lab for pore water analysis. And finally, a core description and general science lab with sample and smear slide preparation facilities, microscopes, and an area for sample description, as well as computer terminals. We also have a clean microbiology mobile lab, which can be used if it's required. But if space is too tight for all of these container labs on the deck, then the geochem lab can double up as a microbiology lab. Next slide, Dave. That's it. So this is a list of measurements that are typically acquired offshore on MSPs. I explained earlier that the limited space and accommodation on MSP platforms mean we need to focus on high quality core recovery, some initial core description, and the capture of geochemical, microbiological, and physical ephemeral property measurements. Downhole logging is also a key offshore activity. And this down at the bottom of the page is a list of tools that could potentially be used for the ARCOV expedition. The final logging program will be discussed and decided with the co chiefs And for this expedition, the logging service will be provided by the European Petrophysics Consortium, one of the ESO partners. So next slide. I'd like to show you a few pictures of the kind of living conditions scientists can actually expect offshore. And these are the non-lab spaces for general living, and hopefully they'll show you what kind of thing to expect if you've never sailed offshore before. Onboard, accommodation is functional and comfortable. Cabins are likely to be shared, most often with two people. And we try to put people in a cabin who are on opposite shifts so that scientists have cabins to themselves when they're off shift. Next picture. This is one of the relaxation areas on board. And these are good places to wind down, socialize, and chat to your fellow science party colleagues and other members of the crew. This is the mess room or the eating area, and we can, um, can obviously accommodate special dietary requirements, which you'll be asked to uh, submit that information if you're invited to participate. And the Dina Polaris also has a well-equipped gym and exercise facilities, plus a hospital for emergencies. And next slide. Everyone finds various ways to find, keep themselves occupied when they're off shift, whether that's reading, writing papers, socializing, or just relaxing with a book. So if we leave the offshore phase behind now, because we can't do everything we want to do offshore, we need to have an onshore science party or OSP. And this is held at the IIDP Bremen Core Repository at the Marum University of Bremen in Northern Germany. And it normally lasts up to, but no more than four weeks. This is where the cores are split open for the first time and the bulk of the core description and analysis is done. In fact, most of the expedition science emerges here. The Marum has excellent labs and facilities to analyze the cores and the whole science, science party must attend the OSP. So that's the seven to 12 people who sailed offshore plus the other 13 to 20 members of the science party. Participants stay in a hotel close to local amenities and restaurants and there's free tram travel between the hotel and the core repository. The OSP is hard work, but it can be really good fun. Next slide. Okay, this is a typical list of analyses that's carried out at the OSP. I'll let you read them for yourselves, but what I will say is that the results from these analyses are published in the expedition report, which goes online a year after the OSP ends. And during that year, the science party have exclusive access to all the expedition data. Additionally, if you just click there, as at the OSP, you will have the opportunity to sample for personal post-expedition research. This isn't actually the primary aim of the OSP. The initial analyses will always take priority, but we have found in the past that science parties can generally cope with analysis and post-expedition sampling at the same time. So final slide. That's the end of my part of the presentation. Uh, as the EPM, I'd just like to say that I'm looking forward to working with many of you. And as I'm the main point of contact regarding logistics and planning for the expedition, I'm sure I'll hear from you in the weeks, months, and the year to come. So I'll hand back over to Dave once more so he can talk to you about how you can apply to be part of this exciting scientific opportunity. Yep, thanks very much, Jez. Um, so that concludes the implementation section of the webinar. And before we move on to the questions that you've been submitting, um, just like to talk to you about the application process and what the next steps are. So if you haven't already found it, um, please visit this web address, um, idp.org slash expeditions slash apply to sail. And it will take you to the main IDP apply to sail page, which lists all the current open calls in IDP. 
and there you will find a link to the various program member offices of IDP. So um, these program member offices or PMOs coordinate the application process for scientists uh, and scientists should apply through their relevant program member office. So as well as submitting your application through your relevant PMO, um, I would also urge you to ask them or check their website for information on participation support for this expedition. So the various PMOs, they offer widely varying levels of support to participate. So the expedition will pay for your accommodation and, sub and subsistence while you're offshore and while you're attending the onshore science party in Bremen, but all other costs must be paid by your local PMO or from other sources. So these other costs are things like travel to and from the ship and the onshore science party, um, post-expedition grants to help work on samples uh, and any travel to post-expedition meetings. And in some cases, the PMOs uh, can offer salary compensation. So in a lot of cases, the PMO can pay for these costs, but in other cases, their support can be limited. So an applicant must therefore find support from somewhere else. So please try and get that information from your programme member office as early as you can uh, to help manage your participation. Okay, uh, so what are the next steps? So the application deadline is Friday the 14th of May, so a um, couple of months away. Um, once that deadline passes, the programme member offices will assess the applications and then they pass a short list of candidates uh, to us at ESO, and they'll do that by the 25th of June. Um, and then the ESO and the co-chiefs, uh, we will review the shortlist of applications from roughly July onwards. Uh, with a view to selecting the science party based on expertise but also on nationality so there is a national balance that we have to achieve for every idp expedition so for ecord expeditions a, a, a general spread of nationalities would be 10 science scientists from ecord uh, eight scientists from the united states and four scientists from japan and then we have one scientist each from china korea india brazil and australia slash new zealand so that'd be an, another five scientists there uh, we also have extra science party positions that we can award to countries that make in-kind contributions. So already uh, Sweden will get extra positions for their contribution of the Odin. Uh, the Sweden is providing the Odin in part to the expedition. And also Germany at this time will also receive a birth reward in recognition for the BGR's contribution to our COP's fuel demands. So we expect, therefore, to issue invitations in starting in autumn this year, autumn 2021. And as Jez explained, the invites will be for an offshore and onshore role or an onshore only role. Um, at that point, we will send you an, an invitation pack, which will contain extended information about the expedition. So that's everything from safety training and medicals through to how to submit sample requests and how to request bringing third party equipment on board, if that's something that you're interested in in doing. So in terms of obligations, all scientists who accept their invitations and end up participating in the expedition, they all have the same rights and obligations. So you have one year exclusive access to the core data and well, all the data from the expedition. Um, and your obligation is to publish uh, your personal research in a peer reviewed paper uh, within 20 months. And if you want to know more about your obligations to IDP, if you become a science party member, please look at the IDP sample data and obligations policy at the address given at the bottom of the of the slide. Now just a, one last message from me um, about COVID-19 and RCOP. Now it's really, it's probably quite tempting to think that COVID-19 might have receded enough by August 2022 to allow near normal life to return. Uh, but if the last year has shown us anything is that th this virus is unfortunately persistent and efforts to get it under control is going to take time, even with the rollout of vaccines. Um, and we may have to live with COVID for years to come. So it'd be dangerous for us to assume that we will be clear, uh, all clear in 16 months time when we set sail. So given the cost of this expedition, and this expedition is about $28.5 million in cost, um, because of the cost, the joint operators will put in place any measures necessary to ensure that this expedition can continue in anything other than a complete global shutdown. So this may mean having quarantine periods before joining the vessel, regular testing, having up-to-date vaccinations to combat new variants, having backup staff ready, 
and of course having a robust plan to manage an infection while at sea. So none of these measures are definite, perhaps, hopefully, they won't be needed at all, but the possibility of maybe some of these measures is something to be kept in mind by anyone who's considering applying for this expedition. So people should be prepared to be flexible in terms of dates and locations, be prepared to accept testing and possibly vaccinations, and also crucially be prepared for potentially longer commitment to the expedition in the event that we're forced to use quarantine procedures. So again, fingers crossed, we don't have to use any of these measures, but it is a possibility and people should really keep that in mind when they choose to apply. Okay, uh, let's leave the cloud of COVID-19 behind. Um, I hope you found our webinar useful today uh, and that it's given you an idea of what the expedition will entail. Um, so now we will move to the questions and we'll open the floor to the, to the attendees uh, and we'll look at your questions. And I see a few have built up already. So let's have a look and see what you've got. Let me just stop sharing for a second. Okay, well, maybe there's a mixture of questions here on science and on logistics and operations. So we'll maybe visit the science questions first. So the first question at the top here, um, this is for proponents of the hi hiatus hypothesis. Um, what is the current hypothesis for how significant volumes of sediment were removed and where it went? Was it uplift of the ridge? Rudy, Kristen, do you want to take that question? I think Rudy's talking. Yeah, Rudy, Rudy we can't hear you. You're on mute. Apologies. Sorry, sorry. No problem. I switch off my, the microphone. Okay, Rita, this is really a key question. Um, and I saw that you, you had this question. Um, this is an ongoing debate. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there is, in my mind, no real pro progress on this. So there are these two groups. Is there a hiatus? Yes. And the other one said no. The other people, and um, so I, I uh, use both options when I uh, say anything about the the asexual hole, and I hope that we with with the arc of drilling that we really can answer this question because we go to an area we have a three times higher sedimentation rate that we hope to be able to see if there is a continuous record um, that we we uh, can really demonstrate that. And so in my mind, uh, there was, again, no major uh, progress. So it's still, the, there are the two options. If there is a hiatus, is it related to the uplift? Um, or um, is it related to the opening of from straight and that we had stronger currents doing the erosion or non-deposition? So once again, I cannot answer your question at the moment. Okay. Oh, can I just add, I think there's also different models for the subsidence history. So I think that's something that goes with this to try to get a better age model um, that will also help with, and recovering that, that interval will also help with reconstructing a better subsidence history. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, next question, what are the possibilities to find a relationship between Himalayan uplift and Arctic ice instability? Well, well the, the point is uh, uh, why we have included that as key key uh, uh, objective, the relationship between the uplift uh, in, uh, in Asia and the river discharge is that uh, based on the uh, the people working on land, there was uh, before the uplift, there was really more or less no major river discharge into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, that means the drainage was towards the south. And after the uplift, uh, these large rivers, uh, uh, they drained into the, the Arctic Ocean. And this, of course, you should see, uh, in my mind, it's clear, you should see it in the sedimentary record. For example, if you look at the, the clay minerals or the, the terrigenous compounds and so, uh, with this, I think you get a very nice uh, detailed record about the relationship between the uh, uplift and the river discharge. And this river discharge, of course, has a strong influence uh, on the salinity on one end, these are the sediments giving in indications for what's going on in Asia, but the river discharge itself that is controlling the salinity and this has a strong influence on the uh, sea ice uh, uh, formation and the cooling in the high northern latitudes.
Thank you, Rudy. Excellent. Um, we've got a few questions about applications, which I think we'll maybe tackle now. There's a couple being upvoted here as well. So I think we'll answer those ones first. So there's a question here. I'm a student of a master's degree in marine sciences. Is it possible for master's students to apply for a call? If yes, is there something that I have to provide in addition to the application form? So yes, it is possible for um, students to apply uh, to, to join. They would just submit a form as normal. One thing to be careful of when you apply is how you describe your post-cruise analysis and what support you will receive uh, to do that. So I've, I don't, it's not just applying to join the expedition with the skills that you might have. It's also your post-expedition research plan, and that has to be detailed in your form as well. And obviously part of that post-expedition plan will be where you will, what analysis you'll do, where you will carry that analysis out and what support you might receive from an institute to do that. So what labs do you have access to? What teams might you work with on that? And that could be more challenging for master students to, to secure, but not obviously not impossible. So it would be really important to include that part in, in your application form, but there's no reason why junior scientists can't apply for an expedition like this. In fact, it, we, we would welcome applications from people of all different levels of senior, seniority. You just have to make sure you, you capture how you're going to support, where you're going to get the support from to do your post expedition analysis. Okay, I think related to that is another question. Will there be junior scientist roles i.e. for grad students and postdocs for the offshore component? So specifically for the offshore component, we, we don't really draw a distinction at this point between the offshore and, and the onshore role. You're basically applying to join the science party and then we will decide you know, what expertise we need to take um, offshore. So yes, we don't, we don't have formal junior scientist roles, but we do certainly allow junior scientists to join the science party. We think that's an important role of IDP to bring the next generation on. So there's no disadvantage to being junior when you apply and we like to get a good mix uh, on board. It's nice to see senior members of the community interacting with junior members in the community and being challenged as well. Both the seniors being challenged by the juniors and vice versa. So it's a, a, a very, um, you know, something that's, that, that's important to the program. So I would say yes, uh, there is opportunities absolutely for junior scientists and you absolutely should apply. Again, just bear in mind that you need to have some kind of support to help you do your post-expedition analysis. Rudy, Kristen, feel free to jump in if you want to at any point after I've, I've, I've given my, my answers on, on app applying. Uh, any advice for early career scientists who are unsure what their affiliation will be by the time of the expedition but are interested in applying? So this is actually quite a common um, problem that some, that some people face. So my advice would be is if you're unsure about where you will be by the time the expedition comes around, please apply to your relevant programme member office. So for example, if you're based in Europe just now, apply to the European programme member office. And later on, if you happen to then move, perhaps to the United States, then the PMOs communicate with each other very well. Uh, they can discuss and negotiate the terms of your transfer to another program member office area. So it's, it's possible to move between PMOs, um, but it is, it is at their discretion. They will have to discuss and negotiate that, but this is a common problem that's recognized that some people have to face. And um, the PMOs, in my experience, do everything they can to ensure that people don't lose their place if they join the science party and then change affiliation. So there was a similar question that was answered, uh, that was asked about that. If you happen to know that you will, you will definitely be moving, if you know the institute you'll be moving to and the country that you'll be moving to, in that case, I would suggest that you apply to the PMO of the country that you're moving to. I think that would make sense. But if you're unsure about where you're going to go, uh, then apply to the PMO of the country that you're currently in, if that makes sense. Okay, I think we'll now just take some of these in um, order. So here is a question about logging. Is it planned to record a check shot profile to enable a good correlation between seismic profiles and drilling findings? So this is vertical seismic profiling, I believe. And um, so at the moment, no, this is not planned as part of the logging program. It was not part of the original specification um, of the proposal. I'm, I'm not sure if it's something that we would want to include now anyway, simply because it means in having a seismic sound source 
uh, emitting into the water, which um, obviously has an impact on marine life. Obviously, the expedition has an impact anyway, but if you, when you start emitting sonic energy into the water column, then that obviously creates a new disturbance for, for wildlife. But it's not something at the moment that we were planning to do. Chris and Rudy, do you want to have any further comments on check shot? No, this is exactly what I, I think as well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. OK. What are the plans regarding education and outreach? Will an education and outreach officer be participating on the offshore expedition? So the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, this expedition, given its profile and its location in the Arctic and the fact that public interest will be high, ECORD recognises this as a, an expedition that will have a lot of attention, a lot of public attention. And it's important that we have a comprehensive outreach um, effort associated with it. So there is a task force, there's an ECORD outreach task force that is looking at exactly this. And yes, there are plans to put a call out to attract a professional outreach officer to participate offshore. And in addition to that, we'd also like to get hopefully a film crew on board as well to take footage um, to possibly with a view to possibly creating a documentary that features the, the expedition. Um, so yes, there will be a process that the task force will work through to source somebody who can come um, offshore with us. They will work with the science party. So the scientists themselves will also have a role to play in outreach, whether that's doing their own blogs or simply just taking video clips and, 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 and photographs. Um, there will be a comprehensive outreach plan that will be drawn up, um, a full communication plan, because um, certainly outreach is a really important um, part of this, of this expedition. Uh, here's another upvoted question. Do we expect any methane hydrates to be present in the sediments? Rudy, Christine, do you want to take that one? Well, there, there is, a, um, of course, there's a, any IODP drilling before we get the okay from the uh, EPSP. Uh, there's a strong check um, uh, whether there's any chance to, to, to drill into to gas hydrates or any other hydrocarbons. So uh, uh, in the area of, of uh, uh, our drilling, there, there is no, uh, no, no chance. <laughs> there is no option to go to drill into uh, any hydrocarbons. Um, there might be some, of course, uh, uh, in the area, there um, might be some um, uh, degassing, methane degassing, and, uh, but this is more biological uh, activities. So, so it's recent gas uh, uh, coming out. And this is known from studies of near surface sediments, but there is not, there are no deep hydrocarbons in our area. Okay, a uh, question here on benthic foram. So for the initial, pa initial paleontology studies offshore, will agglutinated benthic forams be considered as an expertise needed for the offshore phase to guide drilling? Rudy, Kristen, what are your thoughts on that one? Do you think it's something that we, that we will need offshore specifically? The, the point is uh, with the foraminifera, uh, if we uh, think about the ASEX uh, record and also uh, the uh, um, uh, records we have from, from short sediment cores, we have numerous sediment cores from that area. There, is, uh, no, there are no foraminifera uh, 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 um, carbonate uh, uh, foraminifera, but in my mind, uh, what I would push for this to get at least one one top scientist uh, for the uh, uh, glutenized uh, benthic foraminifera, because we find wonderful uh, records in the upper ten meters. Um, there are very different type of species, and and there are sharp boundaries between the different groups. And, uh, but for the moment, um, um, they cannot be used for strategy because they are not really calibrated. But if we have a specialist for, for this uh, type of foraminifera that are glutenized, and we have the long-term record, and, and then we get maybe a, a wonderful paleomech record, I hope, that you can calibrate that. This is really something very important for the future. So I hope that at least one top person for the glutenized foraminifera will be with us. Yeah, and I'd add that the age model is so, just like any expedition, but especially for this, the age model is so, it's such an important component of this that we need to um, 
embrace the opportunity for a diversity of methods to, to develop that age model. And this is one of the ways that that can help. Um, and there, there will be many others. So there'll be several different types of micropaleontologists that are needed. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, next question uh, about thermal properties. So at the start of the presentation, there was a brief mention of thermal properties being measured. I was wondering if this is planned and what you will be using this for. So I can maybe start to answer that and maybe Rudy and Christian, you'd want to, to, to finish it off. So we, we could have the capability to take measurements of formation temperature that was done during ASEX um, using a push probe that goes in, that's inserted into the formation at the base of the hole. Um, so it is possible if this, this is something that the co-chiefs agree with. One of the challenges of doing that though is the fact that you have to stop circulation and allow the temperatures to equilibrate before taking that measurement. And obviously when you stop circulation in the blowhole, there is the risk of the hole destabilizing. So it really depends on the condition of the blowhole as we're drilling down. And of course we'll learn about the condition of the borehole as, as the drilling commences. Um, but if it looks like that is something that um, we can certainly carry the capability to do it, and if it looks like it's possible um, that it could be done, there's also the possibility of getting some, I believe, temp measurements from the hydrogeological logging tool um, that doesn't necessarily measure formation temperature, but gives you um, fluid temperature if there's any flow. So that is also possible. Um, but yes, we, we could carry that capability, but I don't know, Kristen and Rudy, do you want to make a comment on whether that's something that you see as being highly important or high priority for your objectives? I, I would, but for the objective I mentioned, uh, probably not, but but I would leave it open. If someone uh, has a strong interest, some, some scientists who might, who will apply, one can think about that. I agree that there is the option, but it is not uh, of the highest pri priority at the moment. Yeah. So. I'll add in a, in a little bit different direction, the idea that um, if, if there's a really interesting science um, initiative that might not be in the questions in the initial proposal, but this is an opportunity that won't come along again in a you know, for maybe some time, then, then, then put it in as, a, as your personal proposal. And the one I'm thinking of is like, um, microbiology. That isn't something that's listed in our um, key scientific questions, but think of the map that Rudy showed and, and how little of this world, especially this, this stratigraphy, has been touched for studies such as that. I, I totally agree with that, what, what Kirsten just said. This is also what I, what I meant with my, my comment. It, it, it depends on um, if someone has a strong interest in that, uh, he or she should apply and, and, and outline that quite uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, why this is important, and then we even might react and, 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 and that this person will be uh, invited. So we are, and, and there I agree uh, with Kirsten, I totally agree, that we are open for this. If there's some, some good idea also, which we have not uh, uh, considered so far, uh, one really should do that and in, include this uh, piece of science. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks, Kristen. That's a really important point to make. Um, next question, and I think there's a couple along the same lines as this one. How could a geoscientific researcher from a non ECORD country participate and contribute to the development of this fabulous expedition? So um, it, is, it is possible for a non-IDP country um, to take part in expeditions. It's not easy, however, usually the way that non-IDP member, non-IDP countries can join is through uh, a concept known as in-kind contribution. So if a country has a specific interest in an expedition, if they make some kind of contribution to that expedition, it could be money, it could be some kind of facility or some kind of infrastructure that can contribute to the expedition, then extra births can be rewarded. If there is no contribution from a country or from an institute, then it becomes very difficult to include a non-IDP scientist or on an expedition. These expeditions, as you I'm sure are aware, are very expensive and the cost per berth is quite high. It's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, and therefore the, the, the members of IDP are quite understandably not too keen to give away berths unless there's a real 
strong scientific reason or strong oper operational reason to do so. So I think it'd be quite difficult if you're from a non-IDP country to do that. If you're from a non if you're from a non-ECOD country but still a member of IDP, then absolutely there are opportunities, the usual opportunities to, to join. I think that's what you meant by your question, whoever uh, Esteban, when you asked this question, I think you mean non-IDP rather than non-ECOD. Um, but if you're a member of IDP, then yes, you apply just like usual through the program member office, and you have just as much chance of sailing as any other ECORD scientist. Uh, question here, do you work 24 hours a day at the Bremen Core Repository? Answer to that is no, we don't. Uh, it, it is long days, but not 24 hours. So typically the work will run from 7 a.m. in the morning until 11 p.m. at night. Uh, with two shifts that overlap mid-afternoon. So shift A would be from morning to mid-afternoon, shift, shift B will be from mid-afternoon to evening time, but there's no 24-hour working. You might be pleased to hear, or maybe not. Some people like the idea of 24-hour working, some people, some people don't. So no 24-hour no working. Uh, there's another question about um, applying to sale if you're not a member. I think we'll mark that as answered. Is it, uh, is it possible to apply with a Polish affiliation? So same answer as before. At the moment, no, because Poland is not a member of IDP. And I'm not aware of any institutes or the Polish government making uh, a contribution to the expedition. So until, that, until a contribution is offered, it's very difficult for us to consider applications from, from members who are not part of IDP, unfortunately. Uh, what offshore methods are you planning to use to determine the age of the sediment you're currently drilling? So I think this comes back to our similar question on the real time dating of, of the sediment. So Kristen and Rudy, um, do you have a comment on how we might do that offshore? What was it? So the question it's, was... Oh, no. um, so there... Yeah. Go ahead, Rudy. You go. <laughs> the point is what what uh, Kristen already mentioned. That uh, means that uh, we are using uh, a couple of different uh, approaches or methods for the dating because this is really a key point. Without uh, good uh, age control, <laughs> we cannot do any kind of uh, uh, paleoclimatic reconstructions. So that means uh, uh, offshore we have the especially the micropaleontologist. Uh, uh, so we will have uh, different specialists, as Kirsten, uh, Kirsten already mentioned, for the diatoms, for the palinomorphs, and so on. Um, and uh, this is, of course, first of all, based on core catcher samples. And then after we have opened uh, the course uh, in Bremen, then the detailed work will be done on uh, the microfossils. And uh, furthermore, um, then uh, there will be uh, the... Uh, Paleomec uh, uh, measurements will be done. We do some uh, uh, also the logging and scanning, and this can be used for correlation. Um, beryllium 10 will be done, thorium, and all the different uh, geochemical and uh, uh, micropaleontological and paleomec approaches uh, will be carried out. And it's really the key point to, to have an, an age model as good as possible. Okay, thanks, Rudy. Um, another question here about onboard analysis. So, do you expect to be able to do any palynological processing on core catcher material on board? So, is that something that you think we would need to do offshore, or is that a study that could wait until onshore? Well, this yeah. is yeah. The the, the words I uh, I must say at the moment I uh, how the the uh, that has been done during ASEX. Uh, if you do the real uh, work on the dinoflagellates and the pollen, then you have to work with HF and, and this stuff. And this, I'm sure, is maybe not allowed. It, there are some rules. Um, and uh, otherwise, if you look at the bulk, sa uh, bulk samples, you, uh, of course, uh, you get some results of, uh, of and, and, and find, for sure, you find some palynomorphs. Uh, but for the more detailed record, I think, we have to do that in the, the onshore lab, working with HF. Yeah. Thank you, Rudy. Um, here's an upvoted question here. Um, somebody saying, thank you very much. You're welcome. 
Uh, you mentioned you're going to drill where you have higher sedimentation rates. Do you expect to find any sand sized sediments? I've read from the proposal that you've found pebbles, really though, would it make sense to use them for provenance analysis? This would help with the river discharge problem. Yes, the this answer is, is, is yes. Bag, isn't it? Yeah, this is, this is what you do, Kristen. Yes, that that we we in ASICs there were definitely sand lenses as well as isolated pebbles and sand distributed um, much deeper than we even thought. So it's um, it's it's of a priority. We expect it, and we and. I agree with you, it would be very good for provenance. But may, may I add one, one comment? And uh, of course, also Kirsten, uh, Kirsten sorry, Kirsten is. is it's is, okay. Yeah. As long as I say not Kirsten to my wife, it's all right. <laughs> um, but uh, the point is uh, with the pebbles uh, and river discharge, of course, the pebbles, and there is Kirsten, the specialist. That's the ice rafting uh, stuff. And uh, of course, with the rivers, you get more the fine grained sediments. And so I think for the river discharge, the fine grained uh, uh, fraction is more uh, indicative. And, but uh, the key for the, the, the ice sheet history and, and, and ice rafting, there are the, the, are the pebbles. And they are really important. I agree with, uh, with Kristen for the, the provenance uh, analysis. Thanks, Rudy. And yeah, well, we're just going to keep going until all the questions are answered. So a, a lot of people are still online. So thank you very much for your continued interest. Um, will orthogenic mineral studies be part of the offshore and onshore work? I think it certainly can be, um, yeah. or at least with the the offshore, you know, more emphasis on that because it would just be the core catchers that would be available for the shipboard work, um, but more detailed work could be done on this. I hope that there will be someone who is interested in the oxygenic minerals, especially for the onshore work. Yeah, so uh, it's a, it's really really important in my mind. And uh, yeah, yeah, lovely. Thank you. Do you know from ASEX or other expeditions whether the sediments are currently anoxic? Well, what does it mean currently? So uh, the uh, um, so we. We, as I said, we have a, a, a lot of uh, uh, sedimentary sections from the uppermost 10, 10 meter or so, and there are several horizons with uh, dark gray sediments. They uh, might be indicative for some um, anoxic uh, uh, conditions. Um, but the point is, and here we really have to uh, be uh, careful with the wording. Uh, when, when we talked about the, the ASEX drilling, we had oxenic conditions. That means we had the anoxic conditions in the water column at that time, whereas anoxic sediments it could be uh, could have been uh, they could have been formed during oxenic conditions. That means anoxic water conditions, but they also could be formed in the sediments due to the high amount of organic matter that is uh, has been deposited. So. Um, Maybe I misunderstand that question, but there are some horizons also in the uppermost and the younger sediments where you had uh, um, anoxic sediments that has been formed under oxic water conditions. Uh, okay, I think we've answered. I think there was a follow up comment from Lisa there. She's asking whether the upper region corresponding with an oxic ocean is undergoing diagenesis due to the organic carbon delivery to the sediment. Yeah, this is exactly what I, what I, what I meant, that, that uh, you have some, some uh, anoxic sediments uh, and this is due to the high organic uh, carbon content. So this is then uh, more related to diagenetic processes. Um, but uh, if you look at the ASEX record, um, uh, these anoxic uh, uh, sediments, it's, it's uh, more the exception. So uh, the, the upper 200 meter of, of the neogene and, and uh, quaternary sediments that, that are, um, are mainly the brownish beige uh, colored uh, uh, sediments with very low organic carbon content. And um... Thanks, Rudy. 
Um, there's a question here, um, something that I did cover just right at the beginning, but I'll cover it again here is the expedition has been postponed twice. What are the changing logistic factors that make us believe this will happen this time? That's a great question. So the difference this time um, is that we have chosen to wait until the ships have been signed up. So we've signed up the drilling contractor and the drill ship and the icebreakers have now all been signed up before having this webinar, which is not something we did previously. So when we last held the last two webinars, we had still to do that step of signing up, signing up the ships. And ultimately what happened in the last two attempts was that there were problems with the budget we had for the expedition and also with the vessel availability, which meant ultimately we had to postpone the expedition. This time round, we're much further along now in our planning um, and we have everything signed up, all the contractors signed up. And so our confidence now is extremely high that we will implement this expedition now in in 2022. So uh, that's the main difference between this attempt and previous attempts is that we actually have all the contractors now signed up. Okay, uh, is there potential for microstructure analysis of the sedimentary structures in the core? Details from this work may reveal subtle information about the depositional setting. Well, the person who is interested in that is welcome to, to apply. In my mind, it's a, a, an a important and very interesting topic. And you know that we, we have the archive halves and so someone could sit there uh, and, and uh, have a look and then we had the photographs. And, and uh, so uh, I would say it's a very important uh, aspect uh, to look at these structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Rudy. Just a few more questions to go. Um, is experience required to participate in Expedition 377? So it depends on what you mean by um, experience. So the answer, one, on one hand, yes, experience is required. So you need to, you know, you need to have experience within your field of study. Um, you know, if you're, a, if you're a geochemist, you have to have some experience of obviously of, of, of being a geochemist. Um, again, as I explained previously, that could, you could be a junior scientist or a senior scientist. You know, we do take all ranges of seniority that that's not a problem. Um, in terms of, um, you know, do you need experience like of working in the polar regions or in, in, in the Arctic Ocean? Not necessarily. That's not necessarily the case, really. Um, you know, when you apply, just state what your experience is and why you think and how you think you can, can, can contribute to this expedition. Um, and we'll take it from there. It's not necessary to be you know, top of your field in the Arctic Ocean to take part. That's not what IDP um, is about. You know, we try to include as many people as we can from a diverse range of backgrounds and countries. Um, so uh, yeah, the, 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 un, un, unless unless you're not a geoscientist at all and 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 you just fancy coming along, then of course that's that would be different. And, and you don't need experience, um, prior experience with IODP. Correct. Yeah. So people who have never been involved in IDP before, but particularly, we would particularly welcome applications from, from you. Okay, how many geochemists will be invited to sail and which geochemistry tasks will be performed on board? Um, so that's a discussion that we'll need to have with the co-chiefs about exactly the makeup of expertise in the offshore team. That's what we call the people who actually sail offshore, but typically there might be possibly two to three geochemists who will, who will sail offshore um, and typically the tasks will be on board are to do with the pore water program and the headspace gas sampling. So it's pore water sampling using rhizome syringes and squeezers uh, and then there is an initial pore water analysis plan um, which I will just need to double check from my list here what those are. It's salinity, um, alkalinity, Ammonia and salinity are the three measurements that are, that are done on the uh, on the pore waters at sea. And then the other big part of the uh, tasks for the geochemist offshore is to is to um, um, bottle up the samples, incubate the samples to be taken back to Bremen later um, for further analysis. So if, you know it's not it's not a particularly arduous. Um, set of tasks for the, uh, for the, for the geochemists offshore, um, but there is enough to keep you busy. Uh, hold on, I've just, I've lost, I've lost my screen.
Okay, and that one. Made it. So the next question, I'm a PhD student at, the, at a university in the USA, but I'm an international student. Can I apply since my institution is in the USA? I think the answer to that is, is yes, you can. Um, if, 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 if you are, if your, your, I guess your, your location, as far as IDP is concerned, is the, is the institute that you're currently affiliated with. Um, so if you're affiliated with an, a USA institution, then you can apply as a USA um, participant. Next, last question, is it possible for scientists to participate in more than one IDP expedition for a given year? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think um, I, it is possible. Um, I, I, I'm not, I don't think there are any specific rules against that. Um, it was really up to the programme member offices to decide whether they would want to forward your application for more than one expedition in a given year. And that's really for two reasons. The first reason is that um, obviously if you're taking part in more than one expedition in a year, and then circumstances change, and perhaps we, we, know, we know that expedition dates can change. If you're taking part in two expeditions, then there's a risk that there will be a clash if, if dates change, um, and, and that could be problematic for everyone. Um, and the second reason is that PMOs might not want to forward your application twice because they want to spread the opportunities um, and not have one person be given two opportunities in a year at the expense of another person missing out. Um, but ultimately, it'll be up to the programme member office to decide whether they want to shortlist you for a particular expedition. So, I mean, really, I think that it's probably unlikely that, that, that you would participate in more than one expedition in a given year. But I, I have heard that it has happened um, in the past. So um, that's, I think that's something you would have to discuss with your programme member office. And the other thing I, I would like to add one comment uh, to this is that you really should be able to have the time to work on the sediments you got during the uh, expedition. Yeah? You cannot just, you, you, you are on board and then uh, you take samples and then a few weeks, months later, there's the next expedition and uh, you should spend time to work on the material to get the data. Um, and uh, so this is another point which is not, but maybe is a little bit against having two expeditions in one year. Uh, so the last live question we have here, are, are there plans to collect surface sediment for calibrations? I'm thinking about foraminifera in particular. So well, first of all, there, no, there, there are no plans at the moment uh, um, to collect um, box cores. Um, but again, I think this comes back to what was discussed previously, that if you think that there is a way that you want to contribute something extra to this expedition, um, Either as a science party member or as a or as a or as a, or as a, a third party sample requester, uh, you no, know, you can submit that request in your sample request form, or include it in your application form, and, and just outline what you would like to do, and then we as the operator can look at the feasibility of of perhaps including that. So I would never want to say no to these things, right here and now, um, but certainly we would need to learn more about what it is that that you want to do, and and and, and then we can look at how how we would do that, but. I can say at the moment there are no plans, but that's not to say that, you know, 16 months from now we might be able to accommodate plans like that. So I would suggest if you're interested in, in that, then please include something on that in your application form. May I add some point here? Yeah, of course. Uh, as I uh, mentioned in my introduction or my overview, we had several expeditions into the area uh, and very uh, to the, the ACOP area. And so we have, uh, I would say, 100 or something like this, almost box cores and surface sediments and, and, and uh, gravity cores. So if you have interest um, uh, in this, uh, in the near surface sediments, I would say you should write a, a, a sentence or a, a letter to, to the AVI and ask for, for these uh, uh, sediments. But in my last comment on this, a lot of things have been done on surface sediments uh, uh, related uh, uh, on foraminifera from surface sediments. So uh, please contact us and we may help you. Okay, thanks Rudy. Very last question now, how many palynologists do you think will be needed? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
in my mind, it's difficult to say, but but this is really, uh, as you know from, or we know from the ASIC drilling, uh, that uh, the carbonate fossils, or that there are not many carbonate fossils, maybe there are some intervals, uh, but uh, uh, especially the diatoms and, and the palynomorphs, this, uh, this was the main species uh, or group of species. So, uh, well, as I remember the, the last uh, rounds, uh, so uh, I would not say, give a, a direct number, a clear number, but it might be at least four, uh, maybe even more. And uh, as I said, uh, we all agreed uh, that this is really a key uh, uh, approach using paleomorphs for the strategic team. Yep. Wonderful, okay. So we've managed to get through the questions. Thank you very much to everyone who has stuck around. Um, obviously we've gone through the hour, we're nearly at an hour and a half, but we were very happy to answer your questions and I'm, I'm really glad to, that you're interested and in that you stayed around to the end of this webinar. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much then, and um, just to close things up, thank you very much to you, Kristen and Rudy for your contribution today and for your presentation. Uh, and to you as well, Jez, for going through the operational um, elements. And also thank you very much to everyone who attended um, I hope we've given you the information that you need um, to inform your decision to apply or not. And we really hope that you submit an application to, to join this exciting expedition. And uh, we're looking very much forward to receiving, uh, receiving your applications and, and seeing what research that you're proposing to do on the, on the unique samples that we'll recover from this expedition. So thank you very much to everybody. And just one last thing, this, this, the recording of this webinar will be put online in the next couple of days and um, so you can share it with any colleagues who missed out. Okay we'll close the webinar now then thank you very much everyone again and uh, we'll hopefully see some of you at some point in the future. Okay thanks very much everyone.